So I'll try to go uh, fairly quickly through this. These are my disclosures. So I won't be talking about mainstreaming. I hope uh, most people are not doing this anymore. Uh, the most common uh, treatments are EBLT or laser treatment and radio frequency ablation. And instead of talking about uh, uh, managing complication, I want to uh, focus on for this two energy-based procedure is how to avoid complications. So this is a meta, uh, this is a, a prospective study looking at EBLT, RFA versus stripping and and, and uh, foam square therapy. And, and the complication of these procedures are very rare. Uh, and, and patients do very well returning to work the same day with minimal pain scores. Um, so the one thing that we, we have to be careful with an energy-based procedure is the uh, rate of uh, nerve injury, um, especially when you go below the knee, uh, when you're treating the GSP, or below the calf muscle when you're treating the, uh, the small saphenous vein. This is a, uh, a retrospective meta-analysis of uh, multiple papers, and you could see nerve injury can range anywhere between 0.8% uh, to as high as 7% in some series with more than 200 patients. So nerve injury uh, definitely exists after this procedure. Um, when you treat the gray saphenous vein, as I told you, uh, you should try to stay above the knee because below the knee, the saphenous nerve is there. Uh, if you treat, uh, whenever you go below the knee, there's always a, a chance of damaging uh, the saphenous nerve. When you damage the saphenous nerve, uh, it can present uh, in different ways. You could have uh, numbness, but in severe cases, you could have shooting pain down the, uh, down the leg that even wakes the patient up after the procedure, uh, which is a very uh, bad complication. Uh, when you treat the um, the small saphenous nerve, you should, you should stay above the uh, lower border of the, of the calf muscle. Uh, the sore nerve uh, runs with the small saphenous vein below that area. Uh, and uh, damaging or injuring the sore nerve, you will present with the same symptoms of severe pain or numbness. Uh, the one real major complication you could have doing energy-based uh, venous ablation procedure is, the da is damaging the tibial, the perineal nerve. This happens when uh, you treat too close to the saphenous popliteal junction. I usually, uh, when the, sa the, sa the small saphenous vein is going down to the popliteal junction, you should, you should have the tip of the catheter right before it goes down. When you injure this, you're gonna have a foot drop, and this is the one, one of the few cases you could actually get a loss from uh, treating this patient. So nerve injury is a real thing, and, and it's very important to stay um, very conscious about the, uh, the anatomy when you treat this patient. Skin burns are uh, very rare. If you, uh, tumescent should be your friend. If you do good tumescent, skin burn uh, shouldn't be an issue. But when you're treating uh, veins that are very superficial, this is a patient with a skin burn after a procedure. Uh, this is an RFA treatment that, uh, that I was doing. Uh, you could see half of the tip, tip is out. That's because I didn't use the short uh, catheter. You could also treat this patient with a laser. Those are the cases you shouldn't be doing. Um, when you do uh, um, venous ablations, uh, I see a fairly often procedure I call this spot uh, treatment. Uh, patient had reflux all the way down to almost the mid calf, and he was treated with EBLT. And there's areas that the vein is closed, there are areas that the vein reopened uh, with no perforate identify. I think this is a, a case where um, the operator can pull too fast, too slow, and there's areas that can be treated. Uh, so, uh, because of the tortuosity, uh, neovascularization, it's very hard to get a single axis, again, multiple axis. But again, treating below the knee, uh, you have to be very careful. Uh, one of the new treatment, uh, cloudy vein, uh, mechano, uh, mechanochemical ablation is, is a newly, uh, it's one of the new devices uh, that doesn't utilize energy. So you could, you could utilize something like this below the knee. Um, this is, um, was approved by FDA a couple of years ago, and now we have a new code, so we can, uh, this is a procedure that we can definitely use. So when you compare uh, RFA with uh, Claribane, and again, complication rate are very low, and mostly is uh, thrombophlebitis, uh, induration, hyperpigmentation. Out of those two, I think thrombophlebitis, hyperpigmentation is what I like to focus on. Uh, Safion or Binocere is another new uh, treatment, is, is a glue form. Uh, to close uh, your, your, your superficial venous, uh, um, your, or your trunk vein. Uh, this was a food that FDA, there's no code yet, and the results are great compared to RFA. It's, uh, it's not inferior to RFA. The problem with this procedure is that most of the studies shows a high rate of thrombophlebitis. Uh, so this is, I, I think, uh, if you look at the different studies, this is uh, studies looking at EBLT. Thrombophlebitis is a real thing. Um, some of the studies rate a 1% uh, phlebitis rate uh, to about 20%. In my practice, I think it's anywhere between 10 to 20% if you're treating really big veins. Um, what is a uh, phlebitis? So this is not an infection. So when you have an SVT, you normally see a, um, 
a, an area of induration, tender, uh, it looks cellulitic, but it's not an infection. So a, a, an SPT, or when we treat tr uh, trunk vein with big varicose vein, you're gonna have a bigger response than what you have here. This is a patient that I treated, uh, I treated with scleral therapy for uh, reticular veins, and right after the treatment, you have this infl inflammatory response. And then when they come in a week afterwards, uh, they come with this hyperpigmented areas, their areas are in duration. It looks like an SPT, it's really not an SPT. It's the reaction of the trapped blood or, 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 or the blood that, uh, that, that, that thrombose because you close the veins. Uh, so in this case, what I do, I try to release that trapped blood, and I'll show you how I do that. This is another case of uh, scleral therapy. Uh, as you can see, uh, those, uh, those veins were closed about a week ago, and you can see that hyperpigmentation is indurated, it's tender. What I do is I, I, I grab an uh, 18 gauge needle, sometimes I do a uh, lidocaine, sometimes I don't, and we release all that blood and it looks much better. Uh, why is this important? Because you reduce the rate of hyperpigmentation. Hyperpigmentation is a serious concern. When, you, uh, when you're doing this treatment, uh, a lot of time you do it for symptomatic reason, but also the patient are expecting a cosmetic, good cosmetic result. And unless you release this trapped blood, you could have uh, permanent hyperpigmentation. You could see in this patient with severe varicose pain, uh, she had permanent uh, uh, hyperpigmentation that, was, that did not resolve. Over time, it, get, it can get better, but they can't have permanent uh, hyperpigmentation. Uh, I'm sure you have seen this when you treat, uh, and this was a patient that was treated with RFA, the GSP was treated, the GSP was superficial, and you could see this hyperpigmentation. Uh, in, a, in a week or two, this, this patient can present with uh, uh, what looked like a cellulitis uh, with severe tenderness. So what do you do for this patient? So the most important thing, how to prevent this, this is a, uh, one of my patients, one of my employees has severe varicose vein, and, and because you saw these cases, you really listen to me. One of the main thing, I think, and a lot of people can disagree on this, is, uh, especially when you have big vein, is, is compression. She, uh, I did a, a clotting vein or uh, mechanochemical ablation, and she really was good about wearing compression socking. When you compress that, the, two, uh, the uh, the sort of that girl or the solution that you use doesn't travel to all the veins, you're really reducing the risk of thrombophlebitis. This is another patient. Uh, she was a police woman that I did an RFA, and, and she had she developed uh, severe phlebitis, so her veins were uh, very large, and I have to actually release that trapped blood. She had a little bit of hyperpigmentation, uh, but the results were uh, were fairly good after the uh, uh, the release of the. Uh, of the trap blood. This is a patient with severe, severe varicose vein. Her varicose vein uh, branches, as you can see here, they were ranging anywhere between a centimeter or two. These are some of the patients that we worry. If I, if I shut the trunk of vein, if I shut the GSB, uh, uh, that leads to the pulling of the blood into the varicose vein. I'm worried that this, she's gonna develop a big phlebitic re, uh, reaction to it. So in this case, is what I did is I did a uh, staph phlebectomy first before I did the ablation. Results are great. Um, and you don't you don't have to, you don't you don't risk the patient having that severe phlebitic uh, reaction that even though you take the trap blood out she's gonna have the induration and the tenderness for severe wicks. So this is an example of what I mean. This is a patient that underwent a clotting procedure. You can see this big varicose vein uh, uh, branch right here that's indurated, tender, red. Uh, patient was complaining of severe pain. So what what, what we do is. Um, it's fairly easy. We, we clean the area with curl prep. That was already clean. I'm, I'm trying to feel for the area. I'm cleaning one more time. It was cleaned by one of my staff. I don't trust any of my staff. Um, so I cleaned the area, and we just used lidocaine. Uh, you, could, you could clearly see where the vein is. And we, we use a 30-gauge needle, very small needle. I give a little bit of lidocaine. And um, let me fast forward a little bit. And then I just use an 18 gauge, that's an 18 gauge needle, and we just make a, a small little um, puncture. And then you, you shake it a little bit, try to make the hole a little bit bigger. You don't wanna make the hole too big. Um, and you can see all the hemolyzed blood that you, you, you can take out of, out of, out of that area. Um, I don't, I, I usually, unless you're severely symptomatic, I, I try not to do this in the first week. The, in the first week, the blood is still organized. So it's, it's, it's not that easy to take all that out. In the first week, if they have severe symptom, I do warm compresses, compression, uh, answers are needed, and I wait until about the second week. It's much easier to do in the second week. We have done this after, after six months, and you could, you could take all the hemolyzed blood. And, and once you do that, the induration goes down, the tender goes down, the patient is gonna feel much better. Let me just, for the time purpose, let me advance. 
Uh, I also use an 11 blade to make that incision a little bit bigger. You could have big chunks of cloth to take all that out. And you could see that after we do all this, you, the induration is gone, the pain is gone, and the patient is much better. Uh, but uh, one, one of the reasons why you should do this is, uh, is because you have symptomatic relief, but also you decrease the risk of patient having uh, permanent hyperpigmentation. Uh, just a, uh, a quick uh, point about uh, DBT post venous ablation. Uh, so I'm, we are very careful about staying two or three centimeter away from the junction. And, and when I do this, I do it live. I move the catheter live, I measure it live, make sure that there's no mistake. Once you do that, I have never seen a DBT. Now, uh, there's rare occurrences where you have a small extension, if it's like a hood, Extension, we don't, we don't put them in anticoagulation, we check ultrasound in two weeks. If it's more than 50% occlusion, we de we, we, you have to put them in anticoagulation and follow them in two weeks. For patients who have um, a, a DBT after a procedure, we always uh, send hypercoagulable workup because we, we can't explain it. For uh, mechanochemical ablation, it's very important to, uh, to identify the anatomy clearly. If you have big perforator, now you inject in foam with uh, uh, sotradeco and that foam can travel. So what you, could, you could be doing the GSP and then you, ha you could have um, a clots in the, in, in, below, below the knee where you, or you, you've never been there. So it's very important to identify all the perforate and try to close the perforate before you inject anything. Uh, my, my, my technique for this is also when you start at the uh, saffron femoral junction, you want to rotate it for 10 seconds away from the bar to try to really uh, close that uh, junction before you start injecting. Thank you.